a forest pathologist with the Department of Natural Resources. And um, so in this presentation, I'll be discussing some of the survey and monitoring work that we've been doing uh, over the years with Swiss Needlecast. Um, it's a bit of an overview. So for some, it might be a little light on specifics. I've included my uh, contact information for those who may have uh, further questions. So just uh, to provide some context by way of background, um, Swiss Needlecast is a foliar disease caused by the fungus Nothofeo cryptopis gemenii. And the disease was first described uh, from Douglas fir in Switzerland in 1925 hence the name Swiss needle cast. It's likely that these uh, infected Douglas fir were imported from the Pacific Northwest. And so um, <clears throat> surveys in 1938 confirmed that the fungus was widely distributed throughout Oregon and Washington. In fact, uh, herbarium specimens placed the fungus in Oregon as early as 1916. And by the mid 1970s, Christmas tree growers in Washington and Oregon uh, began reporting damage caused by Swiss needle cast. Um, and by the 1990s, uh, the disease began appearing in forest plantations along the Oregon and Washington coast. So in 1997, in response to what was considered an epidemic, uh, the Swiss needle cast co-op was formed at Oregon State University to conduct research and address management practices on Douglas fir in coastal forests. So here's a slide uh, of the disease cycle of switch, switch needle cast, um, which begins in the spring when the spores are released from uh, fruiting bodies on infecting needles, which you see in the top center of this slide. Uh, the spores are dispersed by wind and rain to uh, newly emerging foliage. And if there's adequate moisture available and suitable temperatures, the spores germinate and the hyphae um, explore the leaf surface and enter these now newly infected needles through the stomates. Uh, the fungus then spreads, uh, grows throughout the summer within the needle, and uh, later once again forms fruiting bodies that then plug the stomates. And uh, over the winter, the fungus matures and uh, releases spores the following spring. Now the fungus is an endophyte, um, which means that it lives inside the needles of Douglas fir, and, and only Douglas fir, I might add. Uh, it appears that needle function is really only impacted when the fungus produces fruiting bodies that emerge into the stomates, um, blocking gas exchange and then starving the tree of uh, necessary carbon. So the picture in the middle uh, is uh, a cross section of an infected needle showing the fruiting body plugging a stomate. And when too many of these stomates on the needle get plugged, the needle dies and is cast or dropped from the branch. So stomatal occlusion, or uh, another term, pseudothesia density, and foliar retention, what you see on the right, the amount of needles being retained on a branch are two measurements we use to characterize uh, disease severity. And these uh, measurements are included uh, as part of our ground survey where we, we run a transect through a unit, uh, take measurements and we collect samples. Um, needle retentions uh, evaluated in the field, whereas um, uh, fruiting body counts, uh, stomatal occlusion is done in the lab uh, from needles that we collected out in the field, uh, done under a microscope as you see here. Now these two assessments uh, seem to be the most critical as pseudothesia density influences needle retention and needle retention certainly affects growth as you can see in this graph of needle retention and growth loss. So these four colored lines represent different periods of growth and not surprisingly for each one of them, growth is reduced as uh, more and more needles are lost from the branch. And so these three images on the right represent branches with uh, needle retention values of roughly one, two, and three, which uh, correspond to the values uh, along the X axis. We, um, so we also include an aerial survey component to our assessment. Uh, it appears that Douglas fir with Swiss needle cast often exhibits a yellowing or browning of infected needles, which, which may present a rather unique aerial survey signature or color variance uh, 
that's most prominent for um, maybe six to eight weeks just prior to bud break. So we, uh, we time our aerial survey to occur when the crown color symptoms have developed uh, to an optimum, but uh, certainly before new foliage emerges in late spring. So uh, in the spring of 1998, we set about to assess the distribution of Swiss needle cast using aerial survey. Uh, in Washington, Swiss needle cast disease is most prevalent in coastal forests due to what we consider a fungi favorable climate, uh, including mild winters and wet springs. And so our first surveys were centered uh, along the coast, uh, the Southern coast in particular. Now these uh, early surveys showed what appeared to be a rather staggering increase in disease from 1998 to 2000, uh, which was a bit disconcerting, but when we, um, reviewed the survey data during this time period, um, what we uh, observed was a record of rather unstable weather over Western Washington, uh, forcing us to fly much later in the season. As you can see from our flight schedules, uh, the first survey in 1998 was completed uh, before the 1st of May, whereas that in 1999 and 2000 weren't completed um, or five or six weeks later uh, into, into, into June. And uh, so consequently, uh, these surveys were completed uh, well after bud break. And so why does that matter? Well, as you can see in this picture here, uh, which is taken at bud break, the new foliage changes the entire complexion of the forest and it really adds a layer of ambiguity to the aerial signature. So this, Douglas fir in the center, center of the pictures is, hasn't yet broken bud. It's still uh, rather dark in color. Uh, in contrast to all of those uh, Douglas fir seedling uh, young trees around it that have broken bud, and you can see these, uh, this new cohort of needles is uh, rather chlorotic. And um, so that was one issue that we dealt with. Similarly, the presence of uh, Western hemlock uh, intermingled with Douglas fir and, and really other anomalies like uh, winter browning of uh, Western red cedar, as you see in the upper right here, they all seem to contribute to confound uh, disease detection via the aerial survey. And uh, really at the same time that we were doing the aerial survey, we were also collecting data from ground plots. Um, and this data was actually showing that there was a reduction in these disease severity at um, at least as measured by uh, needle retention. So we have five or so years across the bottom. Within each year, we measured the retention value in each of the four cohorts. You add those numbers together and you get anywhere from 2.1 to 2.3 uh, needle retention values. Um, so not a significant difference, but uh, certainly not showing the, the what we expected from the aerial survey, the disease outbreak. and just. Um, for context, that tree in the upper left uh, has a needle retention value of 2.3, just to give you a sense of what those numbers actually mean. And so uh, for this and other reasons, we decided to table the aerial survey um, portion of our uh, monitoring assessments, uh, at least for a time. So in, uh, in, the, in the decade of the aughts, we employed a bit of a different strategy for monitoring, and that was to establish permanent plots, uh, tag trees, and follow them over time. And so, as you can see on this map on the left, six sites were selected. We had two out on the coast, uh, two interior capital forest and Ilocumin, and then two um, on the west slopes of the Cascades. Um, not surprisingly, the sites nearest the coast had the highest levels of the pathogen. But with the exception of the years 1999 and 2005, the average uh, pseudothesia density was well below 5%, which is a level that we would consider to be very light. Um, and just as a point of reference, once again, the needle in the picture on the upper right has a pseudothesia density value of well over 50%. Similarly, uh, data collected from these same plots, uh, you can see, uh, here we're looking at uh, the, the amount of leaves that these branches are retaining 
measured over four time periods. And um, most of the time, most of the trees are holding on to uh, at least two years, uh, two cohorts worth of needles until, as you can see in 2008, um, there was a rather uh, precipitous um, uh, reduction in needle retention. And for those who were around at the time, you may remember um, we experienced this extra tropical cyclone that marched up the coast and struck Washington in, in December. Um, unfortunately, many of our trees and our plots were damaged as a result of this and um, by this storm. And so we, we stopped measuring uh, and following those particular trees. So this is now 2012. Um, Aerial surveys for Swiss needle cast uh, have been resumed, but as you can see, we uh, we reached a high point of nearly 350,000 acres symptomatic for Swiss needle cast in 2015. But since that time, we've observed a rather abrupt decline in acres symptomatic for Swiss needle cast. In fact, the most recent survey completed in 2018, off to the right there, shows uh, a a rather dramatic reduction um, to about 78,000 acres symptomatic for uh, Swiss needle cast disease. Uh, just another way of representing that same data, you can see from this graph where the bars represent the total acres symptomatic for Swiss needle cast. The percent of all acres surveyed in 2018 that were symptomatic is not markedly different from the percent uh, of surveyed acres detected in our very first survey back in 1998. Now, just as caveat, we, we continue to have some difficulty uh, really discriminating unambiguous signatures for Swiss needle cast. So um, here's an example that uh, this image in the upper left that at first appears to be uh, a sea of uh, trees heavily impacted by Swiss needle cast. But when surveyed from the ground, uh, they look that way because uh, obviously the, the foliage is chlorotic and at closer inspection, you can see the crowns are really rather thin. But um, when you get down on the ground, you can see that uh, in fact, the trees have very little infection and are in fact retaining most of their needles as you can see on this branch in the lower left, uh, which um, most of the last four years more cohorts worth of needles are still being retained on the branch. So on this graph on the right, we combine uh, uh, needle retention and pseudothesia density. And, and here we consider that stands that have high pseudothesia counts and low needle retention to be experiencing rather high disease pressure, whereas those stands with low pseudothesia counts, low levels of fungus, fungi, and high needle retention uh, to be experiencing rather low disease pressure. And interestingly enough, the stands that we sampled within this sea of yellow looking trees were actually in the low disease pressure category. So really discriminating between signatures caused by Swiss needle cast from those caused by other agents still seems to be a bit of a work in progress. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, incidence and severity from the ground. And as you can see on the points uh, on this slide, um, represent the areas that we've been sampling this spring. And as you can see, they're all located within areas that uh, previous aerial surveys have identified in symptomatic stands of Douglas fir. And in spite of the large variability in symptomatic acres detected via the aerial survey, uh, disease severity, at least uh, measured by pseudothesia occurrence and foliage retention uh, has remained relatively stable over the years. Here we can see that uh, the average percentage of pseudothesia or, or fungus in the needles across all sites has varied uh, a little over the years from about 16 to 21%. It goes up, it comes down, uh, probably there's a uh, uh, weather-related impacts uh, to influence these numbers. Uh, Dan, similarly, uh, Dan, sorry to interrupt. You have about a minute to finish. Thank you. Similarly, uh, disease severity as measured by foliar retention on trees between these trees we measured, they're about uh, between five and 15 years of age. That hasn't 
uh, very much over the last 20 years either, which seems to be consistent with a pathogen that has been established in the population for what has likely been uh, several generations. So to conclude, uh, when it comes to being asked about uh, Swiss needle cast in Western Washington, I kind of feel like this plumber that it's everywhere, um, you know, at least the pathogen that causes the disease is. And really the question for those managing Douglas fir is not if you have Swiss needle cast in your stand, but rather, um, is it bad enough that you need to change your course? Um, and I recognize that managing Swiss needle cast in areas with high disease pressure can be challenging. So if you find yourself in that uh, predicament, um, I would recommend um, consulting with this decision guide for Swiss needle cast in coastal Oregon or Washington that was recently published uh, by the Swiss needle cast co-op. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge some of the folks who uh, have um, so generously assisted in this project. 